there's a certain <laughs> niceness that's implied just in any kind of relationship. Yeah. And so that keeps us from being truthful with one another. Uh, we don't say what we mean to spare conflict or to spare feelings or to spare drama. So I, I don't know. I think it's a crisis of honesty and truthfulness um, and learning what healthy conflict looks like. This episode of the Awakened Catholic Men's Show is sponsored by Select International Tours. We've got two tours coming up, a river cruise in Paris, as well as a pilgrimage to the Holy Lands. You can find information at selectinternationaltours.com slash awaken. Hey, thanks for being here. We'll see you there. Okay, Am I allowed in the new format to light this up at this you point? You are. You are. Okay. You have a, you approval. Are we calling you know? this season two? Yes, sort of. I don't know. Sort this of. is like the relaunch. Reboot. This is, reboot. This is okay. like bigger, better. No, we're not doing that again. Um, <laughs> actually, let's just talk very briefly for a moment. This is not going to get boring here. But yeah, the sort of the plan here for those who ever listen to this is we basically, we're going to have a monthly men's night. And usually it's going to include also our brother Pete. You know, uh, maybe maybe Tenny when he's in town. Mm -hmm. But we will have a men's night <laughs> at home. He's no, he's not dead. Yeah, we're we're gonna channel. We're gonna Pete. We're gonna bring him to Pete. <laughs> Good man. Good man. To Pete. Better he's father. Great husband. Yes. Great member of the men's show. No, we're we, yeah we're gonna have a basically a men's night here. We'll pray. Um, we will we'll sing a sea shanty. I'm promising that. I'm committing ourselves to it. That's that's a. I don't know. Maybe we you're won't. putting a stake. But in the we will there. we will toast to your health. Especially, you know, we will toast to our generous donors and supporters who make this possible. And you can be part of this live stream. You'll be able to watch, you know, and, and participate in our in our prayer and praise and worship and the pre-show toasts. And then from you know seven o'clock to nine ish, we will have our discussion section. And those who are outside of the community will get little bits and pieces of the show over the coming month. But you, as a member of the community, will get the full thing as soon as it's ready, uh, as well as being able to participate live. So. That I cover everything. It should be kind of fun. Kind of a fun new format to explore. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that's coming to mind now is uh, I made a terrible mistake and did not think this through. Yes. Uh, I don't have anywhere to put the ashes from the cigar. Oh, man. Oh, wow. Just do it right on your just leg. Just don't even. Just hold it really Okay, fast. Google. Hey, babe. Oh, shoot. Okay, Google, stop. Okay, Google, broadcast. Babe, could you bring me uh, like the glass dish to use as an ashtray? I love you dearly. Okay. <laughs> don't mumble. Be bold here, man. Wow. Take off your shoe. Use your shoe. <laughs> That's so <laughs> random. <laughs> it's all the things that I would do before I okay Googled my any wife to come down with an ashtray. Story. Yes. Uh, it's because he doesn't have a wife. Let, uh, <laughs> let. <laughs> so that's that's pretty much an endless list uh, of things you would do. Yeah, pretty much everything. Wow. There's nothing okay. you could do with the assistance of a wife. Hey, Colleen, I don't know if my OK Google situation was successful. Could you? Oh, right, right. Okay, I see what that is. It wasn't? Awesome. No. <laughs> That's not something to make what fun now? of someone. What'd you say, Colleen? I'll send her a message for you if you uh, so desire. It might require a phone call because this could become urgent pretty quickly. Um. <laughs> It's all right. Well, We're here. here. It's going to be We're great. Here. Here. <laughs> <laughs> just, just dabble into right, right Rob's like hair. Doesn't know what to do. He'll with add a little kick. Yeah. And just spit it out. Gentlemen, I'd like to propose uh, as a, a first topic of discussion tonight um, something I was just thinking about this week. Uh, for whatever reason, I've been talking to a lot of people lately about candy. groups and community and candy uh, and how they what they have to do with one another. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like to talk about Christian fraternity. And accountability and iron sharpening iron because I am a rather hopeless slob and I've been part of many men's groups with other fellow hopeless slobs and I love the idea we always kind of I love the uh, romantic idea that seems to come out of scripture I don't call it romantic in a pejorative way here but the, this iron sharpening iron that men Christian men are supposed to provide to one another I'm not sure if I've experienced much of that. Certainly not any of the communities that I've set up or tried to enter into. Maybe a little bit when I went to seminary, a little bit there, I suppose. But in you know, like my men's groups, it seems like we always sort of end up sitting around saying the same old things. And so my question to you tonight is what is Christian fraternity and how do we move toward like a more constructive sort of like accountability? How do we actually uh, push each other and encourage 
invite each other to push each other in growing in the faith? I don't know. I want to know. How do we well, do that? Well, I will say at many times in my life, I felt challenged by you. Oh, thank you. And the only thing I can say is you shouldn't pick such non-iron-like friends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> to return the favor. To hold back. Thank you, darling. So, to Alina. Amazing. I love you. To Alina. To Alina. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you that. said that. You Rob. need to pick better friends. This that's, topic was not fishing for compliments, yeah. but I uh, I'll take them. Yeah, so, yeah I, I I can you know just think of all the times not only by you know the things you've said to me that have been challenging, but your example as well. Well, and I can say the same thing about you. <laughs> oh, shut up! You're a great friend. You shut your. You mouth. should have more You're friends lying. like Rob here. They're all he is lying. Man, I'm just a good he, guy. It took you like three sips of whiskey, and all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> What were we gonna say? Oh, what I was gonna say <laughs> is, I love you, man, but you're not getting my Bud Light. Wasn't that a thing? Yeah. What I was gonna say is, I I love that Rob brought up that example that's very real and 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 personal between the two of you because what my gut reaction was when you asked the question is, like I I just was quickly running through my head like where where am I experiencing that in my life if I have if I am, um, and I definitely am, but it's also not explicitly in the context of like a men's group in like the group gathering but it is those same men that are in that and other groups but in the one-on-one -on -one moments yeah and so I, I feel like that is maybe maybe you've encountered that in the group setting because it may be harder to get um it's it might be harder to be constructively critical of mm -hmm. a brother uh in front of other people where there's the added dynamic of embarrassing them or, or like wanting to avoid embarrassing them rather. Um, mm -hmm. And when it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's a lot easier to challenge, you know, the, the, the guy that you care about there, you know, um, and, and there's less of that embarrassment dynamic. So in my own life, I've, I've definitely experienced that a lot um, in, in, and I love it. I really love it. And, and I think it is that one-on-one -on -one thing, but you, you really like, you set you you tee up for that by having those groups mm. of men that are journeying together. But I feel like what I've witnessed is it works best in terms of like iron sharpening iron when it's that one on one. Sure. Have you felt challenged by me? Because like I'm, I'm thinking back here for a moment. So certainly I feel like I have been edified by all of our friendships sure. here, gentlemen. Edified is a fair I don't. Way I can't call to mind a way that I've been challenged or called out you know mm -hmm. in that sort of way i've i've indirectly been the reception of this either through some good piece of advice or a bit of example or you're talking about something and it really makes me think you know but well i guess for the part of it i'm wondering about here is again i kind of feel like i'm a lazy slob and and i and I, we always talk about sort of holding each other accountable Iron sharpening iron. Is there more that we should be doing or inviting? Should we be inviting greater accountability in our life? Is that a place I that I'm feel failing? Like we have to in? be practicing greater honesty and truthfulness. Mm -hmm. I think there's just a lot of um, built into just the way we go about things. I don't know if it's a a, a Midwest thing. It sort of gets pinned on that sometimes. That <laughs> yeah. That, that there's a certain you betcha. There's a certain <laughs> niceness that's implied just in in any kind of relationship. Yeah. And so <clears throat> that keeps us from being truthful with one another. Uh, we don't say what we mean uh, to spare conflict or to spare feelings or to spare drama. Um. So I, I don't know. I think it's a crisis of honesty and truthfulness um, and learning what healthy conflict looks like. Um, I think a lot of us don't know what healthy conflict looks like either. So we just avoid all conflict. But without conflict, we don't grow. So I don't know. What, it, what is it that you think could build um, a relationship either one-on-one -on -one or in this sort of a men's group dynamic? I think you're right. The size of the group has something to do with it, too. Mm -hmm. In a whole big group of people, you're less likely to be yeah. um, honest Ooh. and forthright and yeah. call someone out. It's much easier to like to say things to Nick one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. or behind his back. 
Yeah. <laughs> no, but in a group, absolutely. when he's there, yeah. absolutely. Nope. I find it very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Doesn't that happen a lot though? That we talk about. We'll talk about Nick after that he guy. Leaves. He's got problems. Why, why do I come here? Why are you my friends? I'm just giving you an example for the sake of the show. Hypothetical. <laughs> Hypothetical. Pete's not here, so we've chosen you. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you've made it this far through the Awakened Catholic Men Show. <laughs> this is sponsored by Select International Tours. You can find more information about the upcoming two tours to Paris and the Holy Lands at selectinternationaltours.com slash awaken. And now, back to the show. I think um, the other dynamic is, like everything you just said, I think is spot on. And I think the other thing is um, a humility on the, the, the part of the recipient or the mm -hmm. you know, potential recipient. So like in those group settings... You know, if you're nurturing a, a a culture of humility and of willingness to be wrong about things, like then you you establish these relationships where you can trust that if you have something to say and you and it's done well um, and in charity, that because of this culture of humility that we've built around ourselves, where we don't have everything figured out and we want to hear constructive thoughts, um, because you know that about each other, you know, being in that group there's more openness to share honestly but in contrast most of our society today is like you can't tell me i'm doing anything wrong yeah mm -hmm. i think everybody has that feeling inherently mm -hmm. like i think of all of my friends and myself included like when we point or touch about a life where we have any sort of like you know we're not 100 percent on the same page it's like it's hard when people it is so hard to be truly humble and like listen to another person and set aside what you believe in your perspective and like yeah. look at yourself from the outside. Yeah. I know something that comes to my mind is like even when I think um, of like, you know, stepping even into, into a close friend's life and giving them a more challenging, you know, suggestion, it's like. I feel like mentally I've almost swung too much in the direction of I can't possibly know what's going on. Mm. I can't possibly, but but and certainly there's a virtue in that of recognizing the limitedness of your own insight into another person. Hundred percent. But I almost feel like I'm I've, I and maybe we as a culture have swung so far in the opposite direction. We assume I can know nothing about your situation. Like your lived experience is so radically different. I can I can know nothing about it, and so we never really have the courage to say you know I could be way off here. But when I see X, Y, and Z, I, I think maybe A, B, and C, you know, for fear of just being so off or that, that being so offensive that so, you just don't do that. I feel like it's not part of our culture. Yeah. I think you have to have an, a, uh, a mutual goal as well that mm. is uh, that is well defined and understood. Otherwise, a very natural sense of uh, competition can thwart um, your ability to have a healthy conflict. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because receiving criticism or challenge is then received as like, um, as a threat, like, cause I'm supposed to be doing better than you and you're just trying to tear me down. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that competitiveness enters in. I think it is embarrassing that the priest doesn't know this off the top of his head. <laughs> I think it is St. Basil and St. Gregory Nanzianzus who were very famously, uh, good friends, and one of them, maybe Saint Basil. All the people will correct me. An easy Google search will tell you <laughs> if I'm right or wrong. Um, wrote a letter on their spiritual friendship um, and how uh, good they were for each other's holiness. Yeah. And um, one of the things he says is the only thing that we were ever competitive about was trying to make sure um, was holiness. That was the only way. They competed, like to to outdo one another in helping the other one become holy. Right. Nice. Um, but there is this certain sense of um, competitiveness, I think, that leads to the unhealthy conflict. But when you have a shared goal, yeah. Someone pointed out later that 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 our our natural human drives for the competition and for profit. You know, we learn in the Christian life to not pursue those in a worldly sense, but. But not to be eliminated, they're to be redirected to their ultimate goal, which is profit for the body of Christ in heaven. Right. You know, tr uh, treasure in, in heaven, save mm -hmm. up your treasure in heaven. And that's not a, a singular, selfish type of treasure. That's treasure that benefits all. Yeah, your victory but, is my victory. Exactly. There's no, so that, nice. but there's still, it can be a healthy competition of wanting to like do the very best that I can. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Do you find it particularly difficult, maybe as a priest, to find that kind of fraternity, or do you do you feel like you have that among your? Certainly, I think I have that among other priests. You have to be intentional about that as well, though, because there's all sorts of um, unhealthy competition dynamics oh, yeah. there as well. Or uh, what what is your motive for saying this, or why? Or yeah, priests are particularly longest um, homily. What longest homily? Right, <laughs> man. Tell you what. No, I mean that's like a, a perennial issue going all the way back, even into our Jewish roots, like between like the the leaders at the time in, in the Jewish. Okay. Uh, faith like there's always been like this conflict of whose ideas are better and whose uh, ethos is better and that's it's just it's one of those things in our human nature like you rob yeah. said earlier about our lack of vulnerability oh and being and being a leader and being set apart in a sense i feel like it does create an added right. difficulty so i definitely feel like i have that among uh my the, I think the reason that I would call my good priest friends my good priest friends is because they're the ones who challenge me in that way, um, and there is there's a there's a clearly understood um, purpose to our friendship, and that is heaven. Mm. That this is not about my success or your success. This is about heaven. This is about um, the salvation of souls. This is about um, having a heart for the same bride. Yeah. Um, so I would say that, yeah, I've experienced that um, among priest friends, but there's also that unhealthy dynamic as well where it turns into um, competition or... Um, Who's the best priest to guy? Yeah. Well, it's never quite that obvious, is it? It's never <laughs> but quite it is, that on that's the what nose, it is. But that's what's underneath yeah. it. Yeah. Is um, I'm so much better at this than you, because <laughs> um, well, pride's at the root of everything. It is. Yeah. It is. You know, something that just occurs to me now, and I know I, I'm always finding ways to bring up virtue on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it's occurring to me now that that you know, so when you have when you have a group, okay, you need to have a shared mission, and when the shared mission is understood, then it's easier to subordinate one's individual mm -hmm. nonsense to that mission, you know, and to have a healthy competition, a healthy account accountability, because you're both agreed that that's the mission. Mm -hmm. Well, we got to recognize that. Okay, what what are the virtues? Mm -hmm. What are the virtues, the beatitudes, the, the that all those those qualities, those descriptors? When we say that as Christians, we're to put on Christ or we're, we're to be holy, it's easy for that just to be like a, a simple distilled word that sounds great but means very little. To put on Christ means to put on his qualities, means to put on his virtues. Mm -hmm. When we look at the virtues of the saints, we're seeing all of what it means to be like Christ spelled out in all these different ways. You know, that's what the virtues describe. And I think maybe because we've lost the language... In some sense, if you break out holiness into its qualities, into its habits, into its patterns, what you have are the virtues. And maybe because we've kind of lost that vernacular, that vocabulary, maybe we've lost the ability to break out that mission into something that's more concrete. In other words, to be able to give ourselves something more concrete to to, to, to push ourselves towards. Um, mm. I don't know. Mm. I disagree. That was a very self-serving... I don't really. I just was thinking, like, what would yeah, Pete say? What right would now? Pete say? <laughs> I disagree. I, would, I, disagree. I disagree with everything you just said. No. He'd say it exactly like that, too. And I think, you know, one of the challenges Pete. for just me, kidding. like, I always just get a sense of, like, maybe, maybe not for everyone in this is pride, but, like, like, how can I say something to you? Like, at what, what, uh, what grounds do I have to say? Kind of like the log thing, you know? Mm. I got these logs in my eyes and I'm like, I'm trying to remove splinters. And it's like, I feel like that's hard to like look at other people's lives so critically. Hmm. And maybe that's like a shame or a lack of confidence or I something in my own life. That's yeah. like, you know, I don't know, like I need to work on. Cause I, I don't feel like I wouldn't be receptive to other people mm -hmm. saying things to me so much as like, I just like, it would be hard for me to like really reciprocate in a way that's really. The Something that is striking me about what you just said is um, there is there is like a there's a pious quality to the spirit behind like what you just articulated you've experienced, but there's also I'm gonna, and, and maybe we're going to put on display here a potential. He could be way off. I but, can be way off on this, but, but he definitely is. I'm not open to hearing. <laughs> <laughs> but go on, I'll I'll entertain it. There, there is something I think. Uh, 
noteworthy in some of the things we see from like our evangelical brothers and sisters um, and where, where they walk in power and, and the power, the, a confidence of the Holy Spirit, uh, a confidence in what the Holy Spirit, what God has done in their lives. And, and I think that there is a tendency in like our Catholic uh, circles to be overly scrupulous about, oh, I can't walk in power because X, Y, and Z. I can't walk like I'm, you know, in one of the stories in the Acts of the Apostles where amazing things happened because I'm not good enough because X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And I think that the power of of what the Catholic Church proposes is a, a both and. Like, gosh, we're never, we're never good enough. We're never worthy. But neither were the apostles when Jesus said, you will do greater things than I did. And it's not like they were suddenly super holy just because he left and Pentecost happened. Um, And I think that we have to always try our best, but then also be as merciful with ourselves as we should assume God is and acknowledge he is going to work through us despite ourselves and that we can do incredible things despite not being worthy And that is the promise of God. And I think that uniquely the Catholic Church offers that even beyond what our evangelical brothers and sisters have, because we have the power in the sacraments, the power of of confession, where literally uh, on any given day we can become a new creation at a sacramental level, which is so immense. And, and that cannot be overstated. And so I think there, there's, there's a really, there's like a both and there that, that I think, and that's one of my favorite things about the Catholic church. Everything is a both and. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, I, I guess I could say with that, like, I definitely like, I have that sense of powerlessness and like part of that is okay. But the other part of it, that's not okay is where it's like, you know, I don't feel like I always operate in that sense of like God is powerful and he will work through me mm-hmm. in that confidence. And I feel like that's often I lack that. I lack turning yeah. that over mm-hmm. and like I live in my powerlessness. Right. Well, wow. not yeah. in God's power. And we have, and it's interesting. So we, we rely on our own power, our own ability to fix a situation or speak into a situation. And because we, we habitually rely on ourselves. We also begin to look at the world through that lens. Mm. Like this project or this person or this situation is only relevant to me and my my concern. If I can already kind of imagine how I'm going to fix it. And if not, Mm. I guess this is somebody else's problem. Wow. Yeah. You know, and like even, so we're talking about kind of brotherhood here, but like, I think even thinking my marriage, like, I think it's pretty typical for couples like us. Like we, we sort of wait around until something's already an issue before we get around to talking about it. Whereas I should have like way beforehand boldly said, maybe I really think we should talk about X, Y, or Z, but we don't, we wait until like we're stressed out and it comes out, you know, in a, in a calamitous sort of way and we get past it and we grow for it. But I'm always thinking back, like, you know, I should have been much bolder, brought that up earlier before it was such a big deal. And again, it's the problem is I'm, I'm, I'm evaluating my life and my action steps by my power rather than, you know, Lord, what are you calling me to, to fix? And I, I, oh, I, I, should I be talking to my wife about something or to my brother about something? If so, I got to rely on your power because I can't imagine how to fix this, but I'm going to do my best to bring it up and walk with the Holy Spirit and see what happens. Is there anything you have in mind right now? Well, this has all been a pretense to actually. No, go ahead, uh, Father. <laughs> I, uh, I think you said it before that the 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 key to this is really humility, and the Desert Fathers would say the same thing. That humility is really the key to all the practice of all the other virtues mm-hmm. as well, because humility is about first of all seeing yourself as God sees you. Mm-hmm. It's seeing the truth about yourself. So mm-hmm. humility is not about. Um, just I being suck. aware of your faults. Yeah. It's about being aware of who you are yeah. in the sight of God. So when Rob talks about, you know, a certain, like I've got all these beams in my eye, well, that might be true, but true humility would also show you your strengths and the ways that you're able uh, to succeed and to, to help others. Um, <laughs> it's okay. It's so, okay, Google Broadcast. We need some tissues in here. <laughs> so, I'm hearing you. So, Humility so is rooted in the truth, first about who you are, and then when you can see yourself through God's eyes, then you can start to see other people as God sees them mm. and not as you see them. Because we also tend to um, see people with a skewed lens as well, and we'll mm-hmm. only see their faults or we'll only see yeah. uh, their greatness. And 
Um, and I would propose that that first that can't change until we've changed how we see ourselves. Correct. It come. Yeah. That yeah, because sometimes I see somebody who's like trying to do good things, and I'm like, that guy's a sinner. Yeah. <laughs> well, love others as you as you would love yourself, or treat others as you would treat yourself. Yeah. There, there, there is this place where a, a humility allows you to come from that place of freedom, neither having you know this exaggerated positive or negative view of yourself, but having a peace in God's gaze on you right. as a, as a beloved son, and from there having this a greater freedom to look at another person and say, how does God love them? Which mm-hmm. unintentionally goes back to the first thing I said that all of this is really a problem or a matter of truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, being willing to speak truth to your brother involves recognizing the truth about yourself mm. as well. Yeah. And yeah. just tell me, like, just saying that, though, like, my immediate thing is to say the truth about myself. And then I think of all the negative things, right? Mm-hmm. The truth about myself. Did you want to yeah. tell us about those uh, things? Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> what about the whiteboard here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here in this large group. Um, um, no, but yeah. but that that's sort of just the the broken... Yeah, uh, human inclination is to focus on powerlessness mm-hmm. and to focus on what is false. And ironically, there's also a, a grand audacity in in thinking that you are so screwed up that somehow your screwed upness is um, powerful enough to be an impediment to what God could otherwise do in you. Mm-hmm. And it's like, who do you think you are? Yeah, there's a big difference between the the you know recognizing your powerlessness in this confidence in God versus a powerlessness that is an excuse to not trying to step up to what God's inviting you to. There's a big difference there uh, between that sloth of spirit um, and the humility that accepts the upward call to to do something great with your life, to be something great through God's power. So how do you get the humility that you need in order to have a good, authentic? Yes, fraternity. Share, guys. <laughs> well, we could be really wrong here, Rob, but <laughs> <laughs> my my gut reaction when you ask that is like I and this everyone's brains work differently. The way my brain works is I fall back on what I know to be true. What I know to be true is the power of the sacraments. What I know to be true is what I've seen God do in my life despite myself, despite my shortcomings, um, I've, I, I know to be true because time and time again, he reveals, he shows his hand, he flexes and he's like, see Nick, see what I can do, even though you suck. Um, like I, and, and I, on, on an intellectual level, fall back on what I know despite or, or regardless of what I'm feeling, regardless of how down on myself I might feel, what I have to cling to is what I know. And that's not easy to do at all. And everyone has a different temperament. And honestly, that spectrum of temperaments um, has a huge impact on how easy it is to fall back on what you understand intellectually, what you know to be true versus what you feel. But for me, that is like when I'm, you know, uh, honestly, faith, like period, the topic of faith is is a major area of struggle in my life. And, and it's because of, of my time as an atheist. And so Satan... He knows he can just like wiggle in and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what about this question? And then I fall back on what I know. I know that God has healed me of addictions that should not have been possible to heal overnight the way that he healed me in the sacrament of reconciliation. Like I know from experience firsthand what I've witnessed, what I've experienced, and I I have to lean into what I know in the moments where I'm struggling with doubt or with, or with, you know, questioning whether or not I'm worthy or whatever. Because all of those, like, feelings are amazing, rightly placed, but they're also such a great resource for the enemy uh, to, to mess with us. 